So first of all, uh, why are we here and why are we doing this? Uh, many friends and colleagues I've met in Sweden have said that we are absolutely garland to be doing this referendum. What are we thinking of? Uh, and there is a short and a long answer to that. And the short answer is that when uh, Mr. Cameron stood for re-election last May, he promised in his manifesto that he would hold one. Uh, and he won and he is doing. Uh, and as you know, this is not the first referendum that he has held. The first was on our voting system, uh, which he won. Uh, the second was on the future of Scotland, uh, which he won. And this is the third. The longer history, and there is a longer history, is, is around our relationship with the EU uh, and the connect or disconnect between the people of Britain and what is happening in Brussels and how power is wielded in Brussels. And I think if you go back uh, maybe to the, to the early 90s, and in particular in the early 2000s, when there had been quite a lot of treaty change, uh, and there was a program for a sort of European convention, which would then go to a vote of the people of Europe, which would hopefully sort of bring the politics and the people together, that, that did never happen. And so the next treaty change went through on the same basis of a vote in Parliament. And what happened in my country there is that the politics about giving the people a say about the future of Europe got, got hotter. And then you saw the development came next was, was well, we, the government then promised if there was to be a future, ref, a future treaty change, which would lead to more power moving to Brussels, that should be up for a, a referendum of the people. Uh, and then, as I say, when it came to uh, the last election, uh, Mr. Cameron took it one step further, saying we should actually have an in-out referendum. And so that is, that is what we're having in just over uh, five uh, weeks' time. How does it feel um, today? As Maria said, the polls are very close. Uh, last week, uh, I spoke of something run by Ipsos, and the polls there were 50-50. Today, the polls are slightly remain to stay, but it's very volatile day to day. Uh, if you watch uh, those betting money, uh, which is often a good guide, um, the, the odds, odds checker website today uh, would give you uh, three pounds back if you put 10 pounds to stay, which is actually quite clear odds to stay. And they give you 11 pounds back if you put four pounds to leave. So the odds of us staying if I can put this for the Americans in the audience, are about the same odds as Hillary versus Trump. Uh, yeah? So with Hillary to win. Uh, uh, but it's close. And I think what, what you are reading in the, in the paper, what you saw Peter Wolodarski in today's Guardian do, uh, and all commentators, is feeling that it is tense. If you are in the UK at the moment, it is very tense. And all of us with family and friends and colleagues there saying, this feels, this feels very close and what should we do about it? The key issues which I come to next is, so, you know, what, is what is this about? Uh, and you have been following this, uh, as, as have we, and actually since Mr. Cameron came back from Brussels in February with the agreement to make the institutional changes uh, which we had asked for largely, it has been hardly about that at all. So we believe that actually the requests that we made for the changes to the workings in the EU on competitiveness, on the Eurozone workings, on uh, parliamentary power within the decision-making process, on the words ever closer union, we, th we think that they were important, they were good for our relationship with the European Union, and they are also good for the European Union. But they've disappeared almost entirely from the political debate in the UK. Because the number one thing, and most of you are from business, is it's about jobs, the economy, and, and, and that, that is it. So you are seeing day after day, one economic commentator or another, or one business group or another, talk about what it means for business. And you have seen uh, that actually by, by far and away, uh, the, the business community, the OECD, the IMF, are being very clear that it would be the UK's national economic interest to remain. Now, you do have business vo voices saying the other way. So this morning and yesterday, you had various business organizations saying that is not the case. But of course, if you look at the demographic of business, if you are an international business, as many of you are, you get the importance of this straight away. 
if you are a purely domestic UK facing business, actually, does it matter much for your day to day life? Do you see the link? Probably not. And you saw this also in the Scotland referendum, where you had international Scottish businesses being very clearly in favour of the union, some domestic Scotland only focused businesses uh, going the other way. But by and large, as I say, the large business communities are being very clear about the economic benefits of remaining, and as are we uh, as a government. So that's part one, economy. Part two, uh, the second biggest one, is really about I immigration and foreigners, if I can put it that way. Uh, so the United Kingdom has had a growing population uh, for at least the last decade. We, grow, we are growing at around uh, 300,000, 400,000 people every year. Uh, and a lot of that is within the EU movement and also from outside. Uh, and what that means for a lot of people is perceived pressure on school places, on hospitals, on housing, as you know here in Sweden. Uh, and there, becomes, uh, there has become a story about, uh, about immigration, about there being too much of it, about it putting pressure. Uh, and this is, one of the big, this is one of the big issues for, for the campaign. Uh, there has been perhaps less, less debate than some would like about just talking about the benefits of immigration or the benefits of what these people are bringing to us. Uh, but it is, it, is, it, is, it is true to say that if you are campaigning to leave, uh, there is a resonance with some around the issue of immigration. Now, the Leave campaign, of course, forget, and they, or they, they don't talk about, that we are not just a country of people when people come, we are a country where people go. So there may be 300,000 net growth in our population, but actually 500,000 British people a year leave. You know, we have 800,000 people living in Spain, 30,000 living here in Sweden. And all the benefits that those people have from living in a European Union of travel, study, work, healthcare, are probably just taken for granted. So there is definitely a case to be made and made very clearly that actually those benefits should be not taken for granted uh, and they should be seen as part of, part of the benefits we get for our membership. The third area is around security, but I think this is less so. Uh, you have had in the, the attacks in Paris and the attacks in Brussels and the overall sort of terrorist threat, you have talks from both sides about are we safer to be in or out of the EU? And what role does the EU play in that? Now, of course, for the UK as a member of NATO, uh, hard military security is clearly seen as through that membership. Uh, uh, but we would argue, and many would agree, that actually the European Union, from its founding times as, a, as, a, as, a, as an organization, as a, as a community to bring economic and other types of security to the continent has a role to play as well. And so you have seen our defense, defense staff, our immigration minister, our home ministers talking about what the benefits are of EU cooperation in these matters. So they are there, but I think for most people it doesn't resonate very much. And actually it's quite easy to tell a story, unfortunately, that if there's a terrible attack in Paris, then it must be all those foreigners' fault. Uh, well, actually, we know as the UK, in the last 30 years, we've had more terrorist attacks than any other European country, uh, and we should be a bit humble about how that is handled, and we should be working together on it rather than uh, picking off fights. The last two areas are equally uh, key, but they're sort of uh, more abstract. So one is sort of sovereignty, where does the power, where does power lie? And, and as I said, you had a general sense in the UK over the last 20 years that with various treaty changes, power was moving, moving to Brussels and there was nothing coming back. So when Mr Cameron came to European leaders last summer and through the autumn until February, one of the very clear things he wanted was around that, how to give national parliaments a bit more say in the decision making uh, in the EU. And so the agreement we have, which is that if a majority of national parliaments can come together, they have a power to block EU legislation. We think that's a good change. As I say, it's, it's largely forgotten, but it is an important, we think it's an important change to how the EU will be run. Uh, and the last one is really, I think this is sort of existential. So you ha uh, if you 
read the UK press or listen to the UK press over, over many, many years, there is, uh, I put this, sort of an, an arrogance that the UK is, is fine and everything else is a bit rubbish. Put it that way. Uh, and you saw this very explicitly, I think, and unfairly, in what was happening in Greece in the past few years. So you had a large majority of UK or London-based financial commentators talking about how Greece was going to fail, the euro was going to collapse, and it would happen in 2012 or 2013. And of course, they were entirely wrong. It's not to say that Greece is not struggling, it is. But there's a difference between struggling and failure and collapse. And there is a slight element amongst some of the Leave campaign, which is to say, actually, we'd, we'd perhaps like this to collapse. We don't want it to succeed, and it's going to anyway, and we shouldn't be part of it. Now, that narrative, of course, is wholly false, in that when we joined in 1973, uh, there were nine members. When you joined in 1993, there were 15. There are now 28. Uh, and the EU has grown in its, in its coverage geographically and in terms of policy, and has become much, much more important in our lives than it was uh, 30, 40 years ago. And that is not reflected in some of the debate in my country about its future. So you still have a, a default in some saying, well, it's all bound to collapse anyway. Well, actually, it, it hasn't. And I don't think for some of the UK population, they just have the same fundamental understanding that it exists and it's going to continue to exist for all of our lifetimes uh, and beyond. But it, and, that, and that's part of it. So if you, if you persuade yourself, actually, it's all going it's all going to go wrong, then it's very easy to say, well, we should, we should leave and have nothing to do with it. So those are the kind of the five areas that people are talking about. But I would say over, overwhelmingly, number one will be around the economy. Last point, if I may, Maria, is uh, for, us, for our Swedish, Swedish friends here, we intend to win the referendum. No? So we do intend to stay within the EU, and my prime minister, who takes his jacket off of these things, uh, is trying to win that very hard. Uh, and secondly, uh, you and your businesses and others can help uh, by talking about it, by what it means for you, what it means for your families, what it means for your customers, what it means for your employees. Uh, not in a you-must-vote way, but what it means for Sweden, what it means for your business. Uh, and together, it's going to be a very rocky ride from now to 23rd of June, but we hope we come back uh, with a win. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you David. <laughs>